So one thing that I've always struggled, a question I've always struggled to answer, which comes up a lot, especially in conversations with institutions. So I'm actually really curious how you approach this problem, but it's the, the question of capital market expectations for a risk parity portfolio. Um, because it, it seems to me the intuition around the efficiency of the portfolio is relatively tight. You're making very few assumptions. Uh, mm -hmm. You've got a general efficiency or equilibrium model um, to form the portfolio. But then how do you approach the question of how much return you should expect to get per unit of risk, right? What is the slope of the capital market line after you form this portfolio? Damien, you want to take that one? Sure. Um, so uh, it's interesting. So you can go asset class by asset class. So, um, you know, with, with regards to the, the treasuries and the tips, um, you know, there's, there's both the yield, but there's also rolling down the curve, which is, a, which is an aspect of investing in bonds that people don't appreciate. Um, but, but you actually do get a, an increase in valuation, which is a portion of your return as rates come down, as you essentially roll down the curve. Um, and, and that's so e that's even with negative real yields, that's right. That's right. So, so, you know, you could have yeah, or negative nominal yields in the, in, yeah. you know, in, in, in Europe, you know, you can get, you can still get positive returns. Like if you, you know, so, so anyway, so that's a, that's a little bit of a distinction. And actually the way we allocate to treasuries here is we, we use futures. And so futures actually, they're not the total return of bonds. They're actually just the excess return of bonds. So it really is just a function of how bonds do relative to cash. Um, you know, and that, that ultimately determines your, your return pr profile there. Um, and so, so, so that's how I think about the bonds. So we, we think you can get close to equity like returns. If you're holding them longer duration, you use some leverage, meaning it may not be literally levered. So in the tips context, we just hold more than we do in commodities and, uh, and equities. Um, and then the way we solve for that on the commodity side is that commodity futures, I think there's an argument there around what is the return of commodity futures? Is there an excess return or risk premium? And so we actually approach that differently. We actually hold commodity producer equities where we're much more convicted in the risk premium. You know, historically, there's been a very persistent risk premium. In fact, commodity equities over the last 50 years have outperformed traditional, you know, broadly diversified equities. And so, um, so that's that's how we're generating a lot of the return there, reliable return, equity-like return on the on the commodity side. And the gold, you can argue, you know, there's probably not a risk premium there, but it's interesting if you look at the 50-year return of gold, it's actually almost spot on the 50-year return of equities. So that's maybe a, an indication of how you know um, you know what it, what it's like to have a fiat currency regime because <laughs> it's basically since the end of of the of Bretton Woods and 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 when we came off the gold standard. But I, I think you can certainly imagine a scenario over the next 10 or 20 years where gold has a similarly attractive return profile because central banks are just printing and printing and printing. So, so we don't necessarily think there's a risk premium there, but we do think there's a um, an attractive return profile just by virtue of the supply of fiat currency increasing that could be quite competitive with equities. Um, yeah. And so when you, when you get down to it, you, we still think you're getting similar return contributions from the different components. And then there's another piece here, which I think is really underappreciated, which is the rebalancing benefit. So when you have a portfolio of low correlation line items and you're constantly buying the thing that underperformed and selling the thing that outperformed, so you're, you're, you're buying low and selling high, and you do that over and over again, the average return of the portfolio is actually higher than the average of the underlying components on a standalone basis. And in a portfolio like this, we've looked at this over long timeframes, it's about 1% of incremental return you get at the portfolio level relative to the average of the underlying returns. And that's how, like- How that's often are really you guys rebalancing in this uh, in your implementation? Quarterly, quarterly. And then, this, is, then this, this gets to another really interesting feature of ETFs, which is that you can do the rebalancing in ETF without triggering any tax consequences. And so, so it's really powerful from a portfolio management perspective, because, you know, I can tell you as a financial advisor, we run into this all the time that you want to rebalance, but you don't because things are appreciated and clients don't want a tax bill. Mm -hmm. And so inevitably well, that, be that and people have a hard time selling high and buying low. It's just that too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cause you're telling them to buy the thing that just <clears throat> did terribly. So, yeah. and so, so in the context of the ETF, we can do that programmatically, but then importantly, we can do that in a tax efficient way. And so it's, it adds incremental return to the portfolio. And so that's why, 
you know, we think we have a good shot at being competitive with equities. Right. So think, on, sorry, go ahead, Mike. Go ahead. I was just going to ask on that note. So you've got sort of precious metals, energy and non-energy commodities. So you've, you've decided that commodity exposure through the, through the, the um, sort of equity assets. Um, but as you say, you don't necessarily have to anticipate a positive risk premium to benefit from an enhancement in the geometric mean of the portfolio if um, there's a rebalancing opportunity. So did you ever think of, was the limitation for commodities other than gold, um, those that you are doing through the equity uh, piece, was, was that ever a consideration? Was it a structural limitation of the ETF that um, sort of steered you away from the the, the sort of non- the direct uh, gold, exposure. yeah, the direct commodity exposure rather than the equity based equity exposure. Um, so the the equities have a couple of attractive features. So I talked about one, which is a higher expected return, mm -hmm. but obviously there's a negative that comes with that too, which is that it's more equity like. Yep. Um, and so the way that we solve for that, uh, it, it, well, actually, I, I would say the other big positive that you have to factor in is there's a tax advantage to it. So if you're going to hold commodity futures, you would have to do that in a way that utilizes derivatives. You know, most likely you'd have to hold that through a Cayman subsidiary. Right, you got a and blocker, gonna, so there's and that's going to generate hands. income. That's going to generate income, and there's nothing you can do to shield that income. It's going to so if it goes up, it's going to generate income for your portfolio, and so that's that's far inferior to managing it in the context that I just described, which is to yep. basically defer all your capital gains. So that so that was a big piece of it as well. Um, and then what we did was on the on the commodity side to solve for the negative that I mentioned, which is that it's more related to the equity markets is we created our own basket, which was as close to the underlying commodity price as we could get. So, so we redefine the commodity universe to just identify companies that were pulling it out of the ground essentially. So we don't include refiners or even like steel makers because that is, that is more, you're taking iron ore as an input. Um, and so in the mining and energy space, it's very directly, um, related to those pulling it out of the ground. And then agriculture is a trickier one because there's not as direct of a link. So we we chose companies that were, you know, a, a logically connected to the price of, of crops. And so, you know, it would be, you know, fertilizer companies or, um, or, uh, or deer, you know, machinery, agricultural machinery companies. And, but that's a smaller allocation than the other two. Um, and then we did include things like clean energy and water as well. And clean energy, I imagine, might grow as a as a as a piece of this as fossil fuels become less um, utilized. Um, but that's how we that's how we did it. Essentially. Right. So, there, so the, the like securities rather than than energy sector ETFs and and the correct. Like. Yeah, we 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 actually created our own index, um, which also has a cost advantage. So if we're using an ETF, we have to pay another layer of fees. We hold it in the fund just on a direct basis. Uh, it's less expensive. And that's why when you look at the holdings, you might be confused. You're like, why do they hold a bunch of resource stocks and then a bunch of ETFs? It's because for broad market exposure, the Vanguard ETFs are very efficient and low cost. But for tailored exposure, it made more sense for us to build it ourselves. Right. And so the basis it's risk that you experience go ahead. through the basis risk you experience through the through the proxy of the equity uh, is overwhelmed by the fact you get these tax advantages um, and all of these other sort of structural advantages in the ETFs that that flow back to the investors, which is a very thoughtful construction. Um, well, there, actually, there, there's 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 two more things actually. So yeah. one is you can you can basically dissect a commodity equity into equity and commodities exposure. Right. So so you can bake that into how you build your equity allocation, so you don't get over allocated there. So that's one component. It's, it, it just just think of it as two. And yeah. actually, it's there's some leverage there too. So that's efficient. Yeah. Um, so, so it's not like uh, a commodity equity exposure is 50-50 stocks and commodities. It's more like 60-60 or 70-70. Um, and so you can bank that into how you build the portfolio. And then the other piece is that we have a larger allocation to gold than, you know, than, um, than is probably typical in a lot of these risk parity strategies. And part of it is related to gold helps hedge some of that equity risk that's embedded in the commodity producer equities. It really does. That That's actually, a, I think, an... A, maybe an unknown point that the the correspondence with gold and inflation is not as I, the correlation rather is not as great as the correlation between gold returns and volatility, which seems to be a nice offset in that in that sense. So now, do you do um, so? Do you do the gold exposure via stocks, or is that via both, or the commodity? How, how do you? Only, you may have covered the, that. Only the commodity. Yeah. So only we, the commodity we, for gold. We just hold uh, we we hold one of the grantor trusts. Uh, ETFs that give you 
exposure to the physical bullion. Okay. Yeah. The, the other thing about gold is that is that you know we're always looking backwards and seeing what worked in the past and trying to formulate a portfolio looking forward. But gold has a very interesting place today. When you you know we have we've never had interest rates this low in the U.S. and and we haven't had monetary policy like we have today, where you've got a you know you had a trillion dollar deficit before COVID, and now you've got a multi trillion dollar deficit after, and you know with promises to keep it going as long as possible. And so as part you know part of the idea is balance, and you have to you, you can't just look at the past. You have to consider that we're in very unique times, and gold is one of those assets that. It, you know, it's been around thousands of years, right? It's a storehold of wealth. And ultimately you're trying to achieve a, a return for clients that protects them in a terrible environment and gives them some upside. And gold could do, participate in both of those. And you've seen that this year, right? It was up, you know, in the beginning when the market collapsed and it's up, you know, 20 plus percent year to date. Um, so so that, part of this is forward thinking as well. I think Adam, you you want to say something? 